Ladies and gentlemen, dear delegates here, it's a lovely Thursday morning. So I request all of you to keep your mobiles on the silent mode and connect with us on Facebook as Infocom Connect. Do you like us to get the updates? On Twitter, we are present as at Info, Infocom Connect. You can join the conversations and you can also tweet about Infocom and you can share your experiences with hashtag uh, Infocom Cal to 2022, the age of change makers and change makers 2022. So you can put up these hashtags on your Twitter handle and you can tweet about our event, hashtag Infocom Cal 2022. Hashtag the age of change makers and hashtag change makers 2022. On LinkedIn, we are present as ABP Infocom. So you can connect to us. Of course, don't put your phones on the switched off mode because we need to connect with you. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can now download our mobile app which is Infocom Connect from Google Play Store for Android users and iOS users. You can also download the app from the iOS App Store to stay tuned into the conference and you're going to get a lot of information on speakers and uh, the different events that we're going to have throughout these next three days. We're going to have three very interesting days and I promise you that uh, we're going to bring you some of the best speakers, the best panelists ever. But uh, here's a request from my end. I will request all of you to keep smiling because, uh, ma'am, you're looking beautiful when you smile. Yes, you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, you look beautiful when you smile. And all of you, I'll request all of you to keep smiling because uh, it's all about happiness. And uh, when we smile, I'm sure all of you wonderful people know one thing that the brain does not understand the fake smile from the real smile. So when you're feeling down and out also, what I do is I love to smile. And the smile actually brings back a lot of energy into my system. So there are a lot of people, since I'm a happiness coach, I also make sure that when I go for my morning walks, I look at people and I say, good morning, can you smile please? And uh, people often think that I'm pretty mad, you know, they think I'm crazy. But then if I need to make people happy and uh, if I ask them to smile and make them happy, then yes, a little bit of madness is good for me. And we'll do a small little exercise since all of you are sitting here and waiting for the for the event to start, I want all of you to do something that is going to make you feel very good. So first thing in the morning, I think all the executives here, we are here to connect with each other. We are on our phones all the time. And uh, when we are on our phones early in the morning, that is when we let the whole world inside our system. I think the one thing that you can do is not to let the world come inside your system the first, at least for the first one hour. The first one hour is your time. It's your time, so it's when you are not going to allow the world to come inside you, you're going to feel much better and energized. So I want you, all of you to do a small exercise in the morning when you come in, look into the mirror, see that beautiful look, beautiful smile that you have on your face. Of course, you have to smile and then tell yourself, wow, you're looking good. And you're looking awesome, you're looking handsome, you're looking beautiful. Look at those beautiful eyes. Have you ever, ever appreciated your beautiful eyes or your hair or your face, your nose, your eyes, your ears, your beautiful body, your beautiful internal organs? I think we all need to do that. We all need to feel good about ourselves. And when we go to the mirror and we look at ourselves and we say, today is going to be a rocking day. I did that to myself. First thing in the morning, I went to the mirror, switched on the lights, looked at myself and I said, wow, today is a beautiful day and I'm going to rock Infocom today. So I felt really good. I felt very energized. My battery was recharged. And then I did something that I want all of you to do, please. I want all of you to put out your right hand. Can all of you put out your right hand? Dear delegates, respected delegates, yes, all of you put out your right hand. Not up here, sir. In front of you. In front of you. Yes. Everyone can do it here also. I want everybody to do it. And then take it to the left, take it to the left, give yourself a pat and say, I'm the best. Can you, can I hear that? Okay, okay. I'm going to divide the hall into two parts. 
first part here, first part there. When I say A, I'm, I want to hear a loud, I am the best on this side. When I, hear, when I say one, two, three, I want to hear the B section. So ma'am, when you look back, there are very few people, there's more population here. So I want to hear you loud. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm looking forward to ma'am, the ma'am's loudest voice. Okay, for the first section on this side, right? You are going to take your hand, not this side. B is going to keep quiet for now. A is going to take it to this side. Take it to the left. Give yourself a pat, and when I say one, two, three, I want all of you loudly. You have to outbeat uh, B, right? So B is already prepared. Ma'am is specially prepared. One, two, three. Okay, I heard you. Now for B. One, two, three. I heard ma'am's voice loudest. <laughs> Great. So that's it. You need to feel energized. And I hope throughout the day, when you are going to feel down and out, you're going to feel just tell yourself, I'm the best. I'm awesome, I'm superb, I'm unstoppable. That's what got me back in 2019. In 2019, I actually died. I did not tell you this. I could not come for the infocom because I was in the ICU for 10 days. And I couldn't recognize anybody. I had a fall in the bathroom, cracked my head. My, my, both my left and my right brain separated inside internal injuries. And the doctor said she's going to be a vegetable. She's not going to be able to walk, talk, do nothing. And in fact, when I got up, in fact, when I got off the bed, I wasn't able to walk. I couldn't speak. I was stammering. And I am a stage person. So how did I come back to the stage? I tell you, the mind is a beautiful, beautiful thing that you can work on. If you can make this your... Uh, if you can master over this, it's superb. And that is why I'm here in front of all of you, because my husband told me, keep practicing your reading. Read, read, read. And I kept every morning, I used to start reading from 7.30 to 9 o'clock. Kalida, should we start? I mean, if you want me to start, I can start. Okay, okay, all right. So every morning, I would... Okay, so our guest is here already, and much of this banter later. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Show the world you are not here to just pass through. Leave great footprints wherever you pass and be remembered for the change you initiated. These words capture the Infocom 2022 theme in its core. After a tumultuous two years, we are celebrating the change makers and raising a toast to inspire future leaders. On behalf of ABP Group, I would like to welcome all of you to the 21st edition of Infocom, India's top business technology leadership conference, bringing together one of the largest congregations of ICT professionals, corporate leaders, academics, visionaries, and policymakers in the country. Infocom, the annual information and communication technology exposition, was initiated in, 20, in 2002. And over the last 20 editions of the event, has emerged to be one of the largest platforms in the country where the IT experts and gurus of the corporate world interact with business users, policy makers, and academicians with an objective to empower businesses with IT for greater advantage. The theme for Infocom 2022 is the age of change makers. We begin the day with this pre-inaugural plenary session. And ladies and gentlemen, the opening session for Infocom 2022 conference is Decisive Decade, India 2030. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're indeed very, very privileged and honored to have amongst us our keynote speaker, our opening keynote speaker, Padma Shri, Mr. Kiran Karnik. Before I hand over the microphone to him and I invite him onto the dais, a few words about Mr. Kiran Karnik. Mr. Kiran Karnik describes himself as a public unintellectual, a non academic with a strong interest in po public policy and strategy. Columnist and author, his latest book is Decisive Decade India 2030 Gazelle or Hippo. He is widely recognized for his work in the IT sector 
as president NASCOM from 2001 to 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as I welcome Mr. Kiran Karnik onto the stage to deliver the opening keynote. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you and good morning, all of you. Pleasure to be here and indeed very happy to be back in Infocom and to see Infocom back in action physically and with people actually being able to meet, talk, greet and shake hands with each other. So really a great moment. It's been a long journey for Infocom and a rather successful journey and I'm really privileged to have been associated with it for a long time. Uh, this morning I'm going to share a few thoughts with you on why is I see a decisive decade for our country and indeed maybe for the world. Uh, as I do this, I'm very conscious of the fact that there are many people who feel that every decade is decisive, which is true. Which year isn't, which time isn't, which hour isn't for each one of us. And yet, to me, there's something special about this decade. Let me spend just a few minutes on why I think this is special for India and why I've called it the decisive decade. If I look back, and I'll be very brief on this, uh, in the last two, in about two decades from 91, but especially in the decade from around 2001 to, to 2012, we saw a period of glorious growth for India. Economic growth was very robust. India was rising on the world stage in all senses. Uh, in the country, we took over 200 million people out of poverty. Uh, not only was growth good, therefore, it was very inclusive in terms of getting people moving up beyond poverty line. And if you look at any of the figures, we did extremely well in this one period almost a golden period. We had hoped it would continue, but there was a slowdown after 2012 a little bit, 2014, 15 it picked up again, and then again it slowed a bit. And the last few years, as we know, both because of global reasons and of course most of all COVID in the last two years, the overall global economy has slowed down and we were hurt. We were hurt badly. It did a lot of good for our health and protected a lot of people but the drastic lockdowns had their own impact. Ours were brief, and so we bounced back fairly soon. But even today, given the global scenario, we are yet to get back to where we were. So from 2020, we've seen first the COVID pandemic, and then the hope that we will bounce back. And the beginning signs of that, what you would like to call green shoots, were beginning to show up, which got held up for two years. But I'm very hopeful that we will see them coming back. I take a very optimistic look at the future and I think this decade will lay the foundation for what will be continued growth for the next few decades where the second part of this century can and I think will truly be India's decade. But today I want to focus particularly on the technology aspect of it and in this too this decade is crucial because we've seen a lot of new developments over the last few years. We're going to see many more over the next few years and I'll touch on them maybe briefly later, but these are now beginning to find their way into the population, penetrating into the country and penetrating deeply. One example of that is the kind of thing we have seen in financial technology, both starting many years ago, but then accelerating through demonetization and now because of COVID. We've seen the same on things like e-commerce, which again started earlier, but through the two years when we were for many, many months stuck at home, we found that that was a savior. And these trends have gone deep into the country. The penetration has been high. And therefore, technology's influence, not just on the upper fringe, which was the case earlier, has now moved way deep into the countryside and also not just geographically, but even socioeconomically, gone down the socioeconomic ladder. But today, as we all know, it's very common to see everybody using simple apps for payment and popular ones like Paytm or using WhatsApp, not just for messaging or saying hello to friends or to forwarding videos, but also for business. Lots of business uses, particularly most beneficial to the self-employed, the small entrepreneur, you know, things like street side vendors. And I'd like to give this example of 
you know, the, the, the local person, and I'm sure you have these in Calcutta, who picks up clothes from household to household and irons them and returns them. Picks them up in the morning, gives them back in the evening. Earlier, he would go from household to household picking up things. Many places, somebody will say nothing today, somebody will say come tomorrow. And he spent a lot of his time on this transaction of picking up and sometimes getting them, sometimes not, and going away. And he's the same person who does the job or service of ironing. So a lot of his productive time was wasted. Now with WhatsApp, he sends a message or he asks you to send a message saying, do you have anything which you want me to do today, any ironing to be done? And if not, he doesn't have to come to your house. He saves time, which means money for him. And I think this is the simplest, you might say, the crudest example of where pen technology is beginning to penetrate at a very basic level. And then, of course, I don't have to give this audience, you know, talk about the kind of uses in industry, uh, across the board, in all kinds of services, at the most sophisticated, organized level of corporates, where the kind of benefits we are seeing from technology are truly phenomenal. And this is true in education and health. But let me move quickly to the global context too, and why again I think this is a critical time for India. From around 2019-20, we began to see a huge acceleration in protectionism, largely triggered by the West and most of all the US being very concerned about things being dumped on them and their concerns about China. And then, as you know, President Trump practically, I mean, short of saying so, declared a trade war on China with good reason or otherwise, but that really put paid to the whole globalization aspect which had already begun to slow down earlier and it brought in protectionism. One fallout, of course, was people who took economic protectionism into nationalistic fervor. And you could again see this around the world, right from the Philippines, through Turkey, through Hungary, right to the US, where leaders who were protectionist of their economy also became strongly nationalist and the two combined together to mean that deglobalization de was accelerating. This meant a lot for trade slowing down and that context of moving away from global to trying to do th in your things in your own country only began to slow down the global economic growth. Then came COVID and that completely disrupted everything from whatever global supply chains there were to trade to production. And again, the impact was huge in the global context. And immediately after that, we had the problem in Ukraine. And that has again affected the global econ economic scenario, particularly for fuel and food and fertilizer. We have weathered it very well, but some countries have taken a really hard hit, and including the developed countries in Europe, where inflation is roaring and growth in economy is stagnating to turning negative. And finally, you have the much slower, slow burning fuse, you might say, of climate change and what it's creating and why the disastrous impact in global sense may take some years. We are seeing huge localized impact because of extreme weather conditions. We've seen it in our own country with exceptionally heavy rains in some pockets of the country, causing flooding, causing problems. And those of you, including friends here from Bangalore, would recall how Bangalore turned into a lake, the whole city. It used to be called the city of gardens, city of lakes. The whole city became a lake. And Bombay goes through it practically every year, but for Bombayites, that's a bit routine. Chennai has gone through it for the last few years. And our neighbor, Pakistan, went through a very, very severe form of severe weather conditions. Losses estimated at $30 billion or more. So climate is not something to be taken trivially. It's not some long distant future of saying, you know, there are these esoteric discussions about uh, warming, global warming, 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees and what does it mean, but it's here and now and affecting us very seriously. Therefore, the three C's of, you know, COVID, climate and conflict have created a huge disruption in the global scene. Now, this is, of course, in many ways unfortunate, but as we always like to say in our advice to others, that every problem, every challenge is an opportunity. And very truly, for India, this is an opportunity because the global geopolitical scene has changed drastically with the West very concerned about what Russia is doing and where China is headed. 
most of the companies after having seen the kind of supply chain disruptions thanks to China's zero covid policy but also concerned about Chinese dependency and growth have started to look elsewhere and every company is talking for China plus one policy this has potential for India obviously some countries have captured it even now in countries like Vietnam for example have done very well in moving a lot of the electronic manufacture from China to Vietnam countries like Malaysia also are doing well we've been a bit slower but we accelerated and to us to me it seems this is a big opportunity in the years to come that as technology companies for production also for markets and for a whole host of other reasons begin to look consciously away from China and begin to look at where else and the where else question to me has only one real scalable long-term answer and that is India so to me it does seem that this is India's time so long elaboration on that but to me India's time and technology make this India's decade a technical decade where we really look at what technology can do how can we develop it how can we innovate how can we use it and how can we begin to capture world markets even as we serve our own market and improve the life of our people so I think these are the big opportunities that come in this decade which is why this seems to be very decisive and if we can get this going we are going to be on a sort of you know positive momentum a positive feedback cycle which is going to drive it drive us forward as we saw in the period of the first decade of this century when as growth accelerated as incomes increased as government revenues increased it was all fed back into a positive feedback loop that led to greater growth more investment more consumption more production more investment and I think that feedback loop is going to be set in motion has already started but we need to push hard we're now looking at six to seven percent growth but that's not enough we need eight percent plus and that's really of concern that how do we ensure that but let me put a reality check here briefly even if we have 8% growth continuously year after year from now to 2050 we will be in current currency terms current exchange rates and lots of ifs and buts but comparing like for like and not taking nominal growth but real growth we will be at between 25 and 30 trillion dollars which is huge it's big we are not even at four today just over three so phenomenal growth from three or four to maybe 30 maybe a little more but I think we need to be clear on two things one is that the 40 billion by 2040 which somebody has said is possible depending on what you assume you count inflation you take nominal award but comparison one to one where we are today exchange rates today or not even today two years back when the exchange rate was better in our favor to a growth of eight percent will take us to not very much more than 30 35 billion trillion dollars by 2050 at that time if the Chinese economy grows only at 4% over the next 20 25 years so half our growth rate right now they're worse off but they should be able to manage 4% they will yet be double our size so we need to again put this in context that even with phenomenal growth we are not going to be number one but we are going to be big and large and very important both economically and geopolitically provided we can drive that growth and what is going to drive this growth we talk of demographic dividend and I won't dwell too much on that but that comes about only if the demographic dividend the huge bulge in the youth and working age population is skilled and productive if they are unemployed they are not going to be productive in fact they're going to be a problem and if the numbers are very large it could result in social problems and disruption and therefore a negative feedback cycle on the economy every time you have a social disruption production goes down economic growth slows jobs go away instead of adding and go so while the opportunity is there there are yet issues which we need to tackle seriously and to me partly as an optimist but partly at having looked at history and what we've been able to do the answer comes from technology let me first say it's not a silver bullet it's not a magic solution it's not the prescription that will solve all our problems but technology combined with the capabilities we have in other areas 
combined with proper, you might say, social policies would enable us to use technology to create wealth, to create jobs, to create employment, and most importantly, to create equity and inclusiveness. But this requires, as I said, a lot of shaping and doing. The first part is easier to create wealth from technology. I'm pretty sure that will happen. In fact, almost certain it will happen. But where does it get distributed? Does it create greater equity? Very importantly, does it create more jobs? Because you can't afford to have, you know, 100 million people jobless and expect that our social fabric will stay what it is, especially if it's continued joblessness. People today are far more conscious, far more active. I talked of the positives of what you can do today with apps on a cell phone. That can also be a negative if things begin to get out of hand. So it seems to me that we have to plan our policies properly. Technology will drive it, but unless you shape it, unless you make that vector go in a particular direction, it might be a loose cannon that takes off in ways which are not desirable. So it, to me, it seems that we need to make sure that we combine these very well. The technology drive with a lot of other things that help us to use that technology, with policies that make sure that we build in inclusiveness and equity. Because only that can assure the kind of long-term growth we need over 30 or 40 years. It's not a matter of seeing what's the growth next year. It's really looking long-term. So I, to me, that's the kind of perspective which would matter as we go forward. So technology will help us in what I like to think of as the five E's. I talked earlier of the three C's, conflict, COVID, and climate change. There are five E's in which it seems to me that technology would be a huge contributor. The first is economic, and I spent some time talking of that already, so I need not dwell further on that. The second is really in relation to what you might call employment in a broadest sense, and that covers jobs, it covers livelihoods, it covers a whole host of other things. So that would be the second. The third would be something which I've spoken a little bit about, which is empowerment. And that would include things like ensuring good health, ensuring education, ensuring equity of information and knowledge, because a lot of the inequities in our society come from unequal distribution of knowledge. If I know something you don't, then I have power over you. If information is equalized, then we deal in equal terms. Take the simplest example, a farmer selling his produce to a middleman who then takes it to the city and sells it. If the farmer has no idea of the prices in the city, his bargaining ability is zero to small. So there is therefore a sharing of information which builds for equity in a larger place. And this is what technology enables us to do, which is why again I'm excited about technology. Because today with technology, the same knowledge about what the prices are in the five nearest mandis to you where your grain can be sold or the five markets where your flowers can be sold are known to the farmer, then even that small farmer has the ability to negotiate. His small size may be a constraint and then you have to build in social things like combining it, like building cooperatives, like integrating these and then being take, taking it to the market. But the very fact that the farmer knows the price in the various markets around enables him to negotiate better. And I think that is part of what I would consider as empowerment. The third is, or the fourth E, having talked of you know, economic growth, empowerment and employment, the fourth E would be entrepreneurship. And this is something which drives technology, but it's also driven by technology, as we're beginning to see. The startup culture in India is very strong, but it's not just tech startups. I think there's a lot more there than purely tech entrepreneurship. There's entrepreneurship a whole host of other areas where you see, you know, even, even on roadsides, all kinds of interesting things being sold by one person self-employed entrepreneurs. And I think that is something that can create livelihoods, especially if we can upgrade what they do, the value of what is being done. And there, innovation is a key. Innovation not just in technology, which is what most people imagine when you talk of innovation. In fact, India's special genius is in innovation on business models. Few countries have been able to do what we have in terms of innovating business models.
which create use of technology and create value. And you can think of example and example after that. I mean, take the simplest, most known, most famous example of sachets, starting with the shampoo sachet. I mean, but think of all the small sachets which are available today and the integration of that market at the bottom of the pyramid, which is what technology enables you to do. So you have a market which is around the country, but you integrate it so you know what it is, and then you build in appropriate things to get there. The business model of being able to do that is what cracked it. It wasn't, there's no great technology in making, you know, small sachets of shampoo or of anything else, but the business model did it. Look at another business model which is different and, you know, very Indian. The missed call. This is a negative business innovation, you might say, because the poor the telecom company loses a lot of revenue. You want to call, you know, you, you come in a car, you get dropped off here, your driver parks somewhere, you, you say, I'm ready to go, I want to come. You don't have to call up and speak to him and say, come here. You just give him a missed call, he turns up here. You don't pay, he doesn't pay, your job is done, technology enables that. The phone company might, you know, be somewhat unhappy, but that's different. It's a business model for you, right? So we are very good at inventing, I can give you 20 examples of this. We're very good at doing this kind of thing. So given our technology, and I hope we will innovate and create new technology and new products there, but given our technology, we are unique in be able, being able to create business models that capitalize on it. Let me give you one more from the IT industry, which is ancient and all of you probably know about it. In today's routine, nobody even thinks about it. Some person, in this case it happened to be an American, but it could, well, it could be an Indian, but I think he or they, there were two or three of them, thought of it only because they were in India. Said, you know, look, a lot of people around the world, and this is, remember, early 2000s, 90s actually, have their secretaries in the next, just across the, you know, wall, helping them with all kinds of stuff. But what are the jobs a secretary does? And they found that 90 to 95 percent of jobs can be done not by sitting across the aisle or sitting across the wall, by sitting anywhere. So they just moved the secretary's function to India, serving CEOs in the U.S., doing everything, making appointments, taking calls, listening to notes, doing everything except taking the coffee there. And secretaries no longer do that. Eh? They don't take coffee to their bosses. I don't know if any of you do that. That's gone. But everything else can be done remotely, as long as you have a good data connection, a reliable one, and continuous working. In addition, you could have this a 24 by 7 service. So the CEO in the US decides he wants something done and sends it off to India and before he or she is back in office the next morning, it's done and delivered and ready to be printed or to be seen on screen here. Because out here, persons work well, 24 by 7, but when it's night, night there, it's day here, so it makes it easier. The most sophisticated form of this is to do R&D in critical areas where your time is important, you know, vaccines, drugs, whatever. And you build expert teams around the world, position them in different places, and you have experts don't work, you know, 24 by 7 at night. But because they're in different time zones, you have virtually a 24 by 7 team, which is working three times faster, therefore. So you cut down the time. And these are the business models which leverage on the technology of telecom, of reliable communication, of having computers and everything else. But basically they're business models. And I think we are very, very good at that. So I see tremendous scope there for India to innovate, create, and do something very, very new. Finally, the last E, empathy. This is tricky because it can be positive and sometimes negative, driven by technology. And that empathy comes from Again, to use a brand name, WhatsApp. You send messages across and you begin to know other people. And the dream, the hope, was that this would build cross-cultural, cross-segmented understanding of each other. Because you talk to various people, not just your neighbors, but somebody far away, somebody anywhere. Some of it began to happen, much of it does. Unfortunately, much of the social media today has come to another an echo chamber, where you're hearing your own amplified view. Partly, and I think they are, to blame, they are to blame for this, the big companies that run these platforms amplify, they study you, analyze you, thanks to all the new technologies like AI, and then give you back what your view is, slightly amplified. So you connect, and you get downwards, and you get prompts, 
for all the things that match with your views, sometimes made stronger. And this becomes an echo chamber where you're hearing yourself louder and louder, which is anti-empathy, you might say. But I'm yet hopeful that we are seeing the pendulum swing in one way today, where many of these social media are creating problems. I'm pretty sure to swing the other way, and we'll go back to what the initial dream was, that social media and indeed technology will help to link and connect people from diverse culture, diverse nations, diverse castes, diverse religions, whatever, so that you have more social harmony. But that's yet to be seen. But so these are the five crucial E's which are driven by technology, certainly economic growth coming from industry, coming from all kinds of things, empowerment with its information, health, education, just getting in data that you want. It can be employment, again driven by the kind of technologies I mentioned, ranging from employment in large-scale organized industry to self-employment using technology as a tool to increase your business. Entrepreneurship, partly again livelihoods, partly innovating, creating new things and creating businesses, which then create jobs. So important for jobs also. And finally, the empathy part, which is the social fabric of our country and where it is. Technology, I think, can enable all this, as I said, as it moves further. As we begin to look at newer technologies, not only AI, ML, but things like virtual reality or augmented reality, which will help a whole host of areas, visualizing, seeing, being there, and translating into the metaverse. Again, some pluses and minuses, but the kind of use for both, both individual learning <coughs> sorry, and for organization <laughs> would be very, very high. You know, we talk of, you can talk of drones and Web 3.0 or IoT and what it does to industry. And coming ahead, quantum technology, which is both quantum computing and quantum communication. <coughs> to me, it does seem that these technologies are going to help to transform this and make this India's decade and therefore a decisive one for a further growth and progress. Let me stop there at this point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Karnik, for that invigorating start to Infocom 2022.